What is good, YouTube? This is the FF Dynasty coming at you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment below with either love or if you're feeling like some hate, throw some shade down there. Either way, it all greatly helps us out so we can keep bringing you new content. What is good? It's rookie season. Let's go. Jay Wayne, what's up, man? How you doing? So you got the purple light going with the biggie shirt tonight. Feeling yeah. yourself or what? I'm, I'm not yet. I, I, I intentionally uh, didn't drink it all before this podcast today because uh, I knew we were having our, my man Angelo on and we're going to play a little drinking game and I had to come re- unsauced so that maybe I can make it <laughs> finish this thing. Man, that's funny. So we're down, we're down one leg of the tripod tonight, but as you can hear and, and see if you're watching on YouTube, don't fret. We have an ace replacement. Um, we usually start a little late figuring out which rookies reign supreme. Uh, so we wanted to bring somebody on who always seems to have their finger on the pulse a little more of, of the who's who of college football. And so we're going to kick things off with running backs, of course, because that's what we do over here. It's a running back um, show. And who better to have the first rookie discussion with of the year than the king of kinesiology, the biggie <laughs> of biomechanics, the maestro of movement, Angelo. What is good, man? Nothing must, man. How, thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it. Um, love the introduction. Definitely don't deserve all that, but uh, I appreciate uh, you having me on, man. Appreciate it. Sky's a wizard. Don't don't sell yourself short, Angelo. Did I oh, get man. kinesiology right? You did actually. That was solid. That was hey. That, that was probably out of the, out of the three. That was probably the smoothest one right there. I like that, Casey. That was nice. <laughs> I could tell by the look on your face, Angelo, that he pronounced the word correctly. Because it was great. I was impressed. I yeah, love. I was my my wife um, studied a decent amount of kinesiology in her undergrad. So I hey, you gotta know the word then for sure. The correct pronunciation of that. Love it. Um, and maybe we said you were the biggie of biomechanics and you did comment that I think you said that that was a great shirt. I didn't know if maybe you were more of a pot guy or you're, I know you're Chicago. So I don't know. I am Kanye or Lupe. Yeah, or, I'm Kanye, Lupe, all those guys, but no biggie, biggie man and biggie and Pac, That That's it. That's awesome right there. Yes, sir. I could go uh, either one. You know, I, 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 Oh, it's not even come on. Stop. I like biggie more. Cause it's more of a fun laid back kind of, it's more fun. Pac was just real serious, you know, but I can yeah. respect that. And I like, I like, I like what he's got going on, but different yeah. vibes, but I mean, you know, but yeah. both, you know, both are uh, instrumental. Uh, uh, Growing uh, up uh, in the Northeast, this is not even a competition. It's big. I bet. Day. Yeah. Um, so Angelo, uh, at Angelo FF, is that it's Angelo yeah. FF, but the handle is at, Angelo underscore fantasy on the Twitters. There you go, Jay. Gotcha. Check him out. Thank you. Check him out. You, you know how I know Angelo's the man is because his his follower to amount of tweets ratio is so <laughs> damn strong. Oh, it's man. fantastic. If you Good see point. somebody out there with like 8,000 followers and they have 117,000 tweets, like it's not cutting it, but my man Angelo over here funny, in the, in the, I hadn't even broken. I don't know. I just talked to you a couple of days ago. It's under 10,000 tweets for sure by a long shot. And, and maybe it's like somewhere around six and you're just crushing the followers. That's how you know he's follower, got good content. Follower to tweet ratio. Strong, super strong. Appreciate. I, I actually don't, I don't check any of that. Like ever. Like I don't even know how many <laughs> followers I have. So thank you for letting me know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, it. but it's decent for the, it's good, really good for appreciate the, uh, it, man. Thank strong you. Strong ratio it means you're not putting in extra effort on Twitter, and people are still respecting what you got going I love on. Hey, just you know, just trying to spend time in the lab. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's right. that's, that's where that's where the magic happens. That's that how is. we feel. Who has the time to spend all day tweeting all day every day? Who? What, yeah. what are y'all doing with your lives? Get off sure. Twitter. I would do it more, but then it's just gonna like it's just arguing. Like it's just somebody's gonna argue uh, with you, and then it's just like, mm, I can't do it. Um, Angelo also has a fantastic website, Angelo analysis.com. Um, he's got all sorts of stuff going on over there. The Debbie prospects who's next series. Yeah. You got to check out that, that who's next series. It's pretty much a must read. Um, it's kind of a continuation of what you got on Twitter, but he just, I find myself try, seeing a player and, and trying to describe basically his movement skills. And I'm like typing down words and then I go, <laughs> I go and read your who's next thing and you've got like things like uh, uh, just 
torque and you're using you just just the way you break things down makes this it, it sounds smart but it's simple to follow along and you've got good visuals like you guys got to go check out this website he's putting out great stuff and that's that's free there's also a paid subscription to get some more stuff uh like rankings and draft guys and stuff like that and i know you're working on uh, yeah. some revamping of that website as well right angelo yeah no i mean that's kind of my big project this off season um i think the first thing i want to do is the ascension rankings and we talked about that a little before the show um i'm gonna basically be charting um running backs receivers from their freshman years you know to when they you know basically enter college when they exit college and go to the nfl draft uh so guys like you know bajan robinson uh jameer gibbs uh, from Georgia Tech. I mean, guys like that who are going to probably be day one, day two NFL picks. So what are they like when they when they walk in the doors as freshmen, and, you know, and contribute? You know, what kind of skills do they have? What do they bring to the table athletically and as a mover? And how does that evolve and change over time? And that's, yeah, I drink that up. Um, <laughs> and that's going to be the big thing is, you know, looking at that and, and charting that and letting everybody kind of see the development of those guys and, and what that means. Well, that's yeah, fantastic. So- Angelo is a super smart dude, and and all you got to do, go back and listen to the show. We had him on. It was almost a year ago now. It was like our Probably. first. It was our first social distance show that we did. It was like our first virtual show. I remember that. Our, yep. our first yep. virtual guest, and it was a fantastic show. I went back and listened to it. I think it was actually two episodes we broke it into, and just listen to you talk about the prospects and what was going to happen, and so much of it was so spot on, and you threw in extra stuff like you were – you, you propped up Rojo, which I thought we were the only people that liked Rojo. Yeah, you, I do remember that. Yeah, you yeah. threw some Rojo love. You threw some Mo- David Montgomery love out there. Yes. We, we've been all on him this offseason yeah. throughout the season and then the obviously Bears fan, yep. championship. And, and curious to see how what's your uh, what's your thoughts on the Chicago situation real quick. I mean, oh, stop. quarterback in flux, your coach is back. Man, you, know, you ruined my night. He's going to come back healthy. Does that how does that negatively affect David Montgomery? That's oh. a lot of questions there. But what's your what's your uh, what are you feeling about your Bears over there? Oh. What's the www.angeloanalysis.com <sighs> Bears breakdown? Uh, it's, it's I'll say this man hashtag not good. Like it's it's one of those. <laughs> It's tough, man. The Bears are in a, a bad, bad situation, in a bad cap situation. Allen Robinson doesn't seemingly want to come back. Um, Matt Nagy's back, but how do you the, feel about the that? Worst, I, I don't. I don't like Matt Nagy very much. I don't think he's. I think he's a good motivator. I don't think he's a good play caller. At least he did give up play calling, right? That was. Oh, dude, when Bill Lazor took over, it was. I mean, starting having Rashad Coward start. I don't know if you know who that is. But he's probably the worst offensive lineman to yeah. start a game in the history of the NFL. And just watching watching them trot him out every single game. Uh, was it as soon as Laser came? Did they bring two guys up off the practice? It was or? Alex Bars um, and Sam Mustafer. Yeah. They came in, they bumped the Fetty out the tackle. Um, and then you saw, you know, you saw it was a Dave Montgomery train for the you last. You saw them actually get an season. identity. Like it, the identity was hand the ball, Dave Montgomery, and then right. hopefully your defense holds him. because Mitch isn't going to do anything. I mean, Mitch is a, he's, he's a talented kid, but he, you know, the processing part of the game doesn't have that. Um, but in short, it's going to be a really, it's going to be a turbulent off season as a bears fan, because you're, we're going to have to try to find a quarterback via the draft or via trade. Uh, you know, I'd like them to make a move on Stafford probably won't happen. Um, but yeah, guys like Trey Lance is intriguing for Chicago if they trade up. Yeah. He's a guy I'm really high on. I like him a ton. Me too. I really like Trey Lance. Um, really skilled dude. Um, really athletic. Makes all the throws. I mean, he needs to be coached up a bit. I mean, he's really raw. Sure. But, you know, but. he's a guy that I think the, the Bears need to grow with somebody. I mean, the, they've never had a. Yeah, he didn't turn it over a ton. Passing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What was, what was his. Um, I, think, was it, I think I think he had like two. Yeah. Some, cr- something like some that. crazy yeah, number. Yeah. Yeah. And so. He's good, man. I mean, but I don't know what the Bears are going to do. Uh, Tariq Cohen coming back to answer your question. I don't know if it's going to impact Dave Montgomery as much as we think. All right. Because Dave Montgomery has proven to be a better receiver than Tariq Cohen was. Um, he was one of the more efficient receivers in the NFL this year at the position and was more efficient than Tariq Cohen when Tariq Cohen was healthy. So the problem is, the, the Bears Matt don't Nagy. make great decisions. Yeah. And Matt Nagy doesn't make great decisions in terms of who to put on the field. We saw Cordell Patterson a ton in short yardage situations. 
bro. Like, yeah. come on. What are we doing? We've seen like, this. We've seen oh this play out so many times, and it's never good. Oh my god! Like you He'll can't, do like, like one one thing every like four games to be like, oh shit, look at that. Oh, dude, like that, that, that kind of no sucks because it's like, oh, now oh. he's gonna get more tries, just like going to the playoffs. Now Matt Nagy's gonna be brought back. Like, <laughs> you have no idea how frustrating it is sitting on my couch, third and one. Cordell Patterson comes in. Oh my god! Well. What are we doing? Fourth down. <laughs> Just run it with Mitch if you're going to bring Cordell oh Patterson. <laughs> but that's a conversation for another day. But I mean, yeah. I, I think Dave Montgomery is still probably, even if Cohen returns and Cohen's fine, he had a significant, I mean, ACL tear. I think he also fractured part of his fibula. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what it was. So his rehab's going to be pretty, you know, pretty intensive. Aggressive, yeah. So, you know, I think Montgomery's still back in RB1. Yeah. That's I not mean, bad. We it's it's almost like he might be hashtag good at football that a lot of people didn't want to say he was. I mean, hey, the, haters, yeah. the haters are going to say the schedule was easy, but I mean, whatever. No, he's a good back, man. He's, he's, he's a good back. He still still get still get some hate um, because of the forty and because of that that weird graphic that went out his senior year. Yeah. Um, but he's a like good. He back. had anything he's to do good. with that? Like, no, but he, he's a good back. You know, I like watching him in he's Chicago. A great dude. So yeah. Yeah. No, we 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 really like we really like. Uh, Montgomery, it was nice that he was like a league winner this year. Oh, uh, I was using all my teams. It was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Um, fantastic. One thing before we get rolling here, um, I wanted to give you a shout out well, on the last show. Like Jay Wayne talked about, you you had some uh, Ahmed takes that you really liked uh, him, and and he came in and, and yeah. ended up uh, playing well at the end of the season for the Thank Dolphins. You. Any any thoughts on? On him moving forward, you, it's gonna be you, tough you to predict. Kind of keep him around. You trying to trying to maybe capitalize off anything you can get for him, or is he worth sticking around? Because I think um, we've had this conversation yeah. amongst ourselves, and I think we're all kind of in the camp of we're, we'll just hold at this point. I think you kind of have to. I think you got to look. You kind of have to see what happens in the NFL draft. What floors and company does at the running back position. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if Flores drafts Najee Harris, sure. Sure. Then, well, that's your three down bell cow and right. that's the way it's going to be. But what if they don't draft the back until the third, fourth round, they land Ramondre Stevenson. Yeah. Um, then it's like, okay, then it might be a committee, but you know, I've been had a good, he had a good rookie season. Right? Yeah, just, and so did Gaskin had a good sophomore year, but you know, he had, he looked good. Just like we talked about on the show last year, he's a good player, explosive athlete, um, he was, he was, you know, he did well in his opportunities, but you know, he's, he's, he's gotta be a hold. If you can sell him and get like a second form, then do it. Um, but he, we just don't know right now. We don't know enough right now. Don't have enough information. I think. Yeah. All right. Um, last year we did, well, I think our key words were micro movement and ecosystem. Just movement. I don't think just, it was just movement. movement. Mic- it was micros, just... micros tough. I don't float that out there often. Okay, I, can, okay. I can though, just for Jay. Okay. Um, can toss so... it out. No, I'm going it, with anything with the M O V E is a root word. Is Ooh. there movement, moving, mover? Ooh. Is All there that that's on the is there a I new got, is there got, a new got, word I got, for I got a bucket of beer ready to go? Uh, oh, I, love so it. I can make sure I don't run out. Is there a new word for our oh, drinking game this year that you're on? You like you got a new word that you find yourself typing over and over and over again? I don't actually. Well, like, I'll throw I'll throw one out there. We're, I'm Jay, going ecosystem. Ecosystem. Yeah. If I can get you to say eco, if we can say ecosystem, that's like if a you can get me to say ecosystem, oh. I'll be I'll be I'll be. Already, impressed. I remember we were talking about that during the land for landing spots last year. That yeah. was why that came up. Um, well, we're gonna talk some ecosystems tonight, oh, baby. Stop. Let's now we it. are. So <laughs> Jay's going away from the show sheet just to get some drinking, and I love it. This oh, we got we got ecosystem on on well at least on my show sheet, and I have <laughs> oh, ecosystem yeah. written in to, to to at least two oh, dudes. Oh, stop! Um, yep. love it. All right, so let's get started here again. But right before we get into the actual prospects, let's just talk about the combine a little bit. It's going to be different this year. Obviously, there's no commutative uh, gathering. Going to be uh-huh. kind of done like more like pro style system, which is or pro day system, which is you know maybe not the most um it's inflated yeah honest way no, honest isn't the right word but you ran a 4-1 i don't know right. that's what the clock says <laughs> yeah th- there may be some liberties possibly taken in some pro day stuff do you think 14 that one, foot broad it's going to be the record for all these <laughs> <laughs> measurements <laughs> do you think how much do you think that uh helps or or hurts people and and what are your thoughts on that i think for a lot of prospects 
these, you know, scouts, general managers, position coaches in general kind of know what these guys are at this point. I think the combine is always used as, as verification, right? You really don't learn a lot from the combine. To me, I always learn the most from the interviews. That's the biggest thing. You know, when we're talking about, you know, how quickly can guys pick up an offense, um, you know, how well they speak, you know, their character, that type of thing. That's what really matters more to me about the combine. Um, when I watch those, when I watch those videos, ton, I remember Garrett Price, um, he's a dynasty nurse, great dude. Um, he was at the combine last year in Indy and did a lot of, you know, prospect interviews. I remember um, he, had, he had a couple of them that were really, really good. And DJ Dallas was the one of them he did. And it's just learning more about them as a person. What, you know, what are some of their, you know, I guess concerns going to the NFL or, you know, what are some things you probably wouldn't know from like the physical profile and, and the testing metrics and all that. But not having a combine this year will be interesting because those fringe and bubble players might get hurt by that. Yeah, that's a big part Excuse of it, me. I think, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and I think like we said before the show with guys like Chuba Hubbard and Tamori on Terry, who were better last year, didn't have as didn't have as great of a season during this COVID year, um, injuries, whatnot. This that's kind of like their chance to prove the the legitimacy behind, you know, for those two guys, it's their speed, right? With Chuba Hubbard, guy was a 10-5-5 guy in high school in the hundred meters, absolute track star. So he would probably time in, you know, four, three, seven ish range to Marianne Terry absolute jet, right. At yeah. his size, six, four, 215 plus pounds. I mean, you know, he runs four, three, three, four, three, four back end first rounder. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, that, at that size, that's what you're probably going to get. I mean, especially if you look at, you know, recent history, Brashad Perryman was a first round pick for sure. crying out loud. Sure. Kevin and White. yeah. Kevin White, oh, my Bears. Uh, that's tough. <laughs> I like I mean, without Kevin. injury, that man, that man could ball. I like injury. Kevin White, yeah. But um, Who's but, the yeah, Baylor I mean, guy that year, too? Uh, Corey. Corey Coleman. Coleman. Yeah. That was a Which bad is, year for It's interesting kind of talking about culture and climate and just like how I, ecosystem. Like, every, anybody coming out of that ecosystem never, it was kind of tainted. Nobody liked that. That I believe that was like the Art Bryles era where there, it was just like a garbage program where they were like these none of these guys are ready to play in the nfl it's just like super simple super easy just yeah. all built on like one concept and like it's almost none of those guys translated yeah. it was just more of like a maturation thing i think yeah. for a guy like coleman i remember watching my hard knocks too and it's like he seemed overwhelmed yeah, yeah and that's sure. kind of the biggest thing is you like man the nfl is a big stage like this is yeah. it is a huge deal to be an nfl athlete and some of those guys just don't know what it takes. Yeah. I right? mean, this is part of my, like, I'd say 25% of my process of going through all these things and I'm slow at this and it takes me a while to go through sure. it. I, it's I like January to of, guys, right. It's I like January. to watch a lot of things multiple times and I'm certainly no expert on, on any sort of player break. I've just been, I played football and I've been watching football my whole life. Um, and I, we have a decent track record here, but like, I probably spend 25% of my time digging through who this guy is and trying to find as many interviews as I can and like seeing where he came from and seeing what people say about him and seeing like, like you said, how he speaks and all, I think those things are so important. And sometimes it just flat out doesn't fucking matter. Um, right, just because right. he, he, They're so good, but right. You know, it's such a big check Mark for, I know me and Jay Wayne that we spend a, a lot of time, uh, I would probably say 25% of the time on prospects is, is just that. Oh yeah. It's huge. Especially when you're trying to look at guys who might bust. Right. Um, a lot of times it's not the physical talent. I mean, if you are a first round draft pick in the NFL, you are the 0.001% of physical talents in this whole planet. However, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is the mental, the social emotional part of it. Um, as well as, you know, being mature enough to accept that this is your job. Like right. your job is to play professional football and get hit for 60 minutes, especially if you're an NFL running back and take care of your body and, you know, do the little things right. Right. Some of these guys don't understand that they come from upbringings where this, you know, this amount of money or what have you is so seldom. Right. And so they're put in a, you know, precarious situation. Cause when, you know, you get your first, you know, you, first, you get your first game check or you, you know, you, you get your first signing bonus. 
man, your aunt's asking for money. Your uncle's asking for money. Yeah. Your fourth cousin's asking for money. And that's overwhelming, man. And I think that's, yeah. a, it's, it's tough, especially on your mental health. When you have people knocking at your door, wanting something from you and you know, you're 19, 20, 21, 22 year old kid. Like you don't right. want to say no. Well, you don't know how to say no. And and you have no idea how to do anything with any sort of funds or management of any, so you're just like, Oh, this is all the money that I got, but you don't really have all that money. And it's it's, a hundred percent. It's like the, yeah. It's so, and it's so much money that compared to like what you said, what they probably grew up with. And like, you know, even from, you know, if I were to get an NFL game check that to me, that would be like so much money. And you think it might last forever, right? And you also think right. that you're like the best because if you're a first round pick and you're the point zero 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 one talent, then you might rest on those laurels and and you're not gonna last long if you're not coming in right. ready to work as well. Right. No, it happens because you know the, the goal in the NFL and you know, and working kind of in that realm and being around some guys who made it that far and working with them too, you know, that second contract was what matters. Mm-hmm. Like people don't understand that like you're trying to set your you know familial wealth is the, is the term that we use you're trying to set yourself up to where your family is wealthy right and that's the most important part and that's so like that's so seldom talk talked about is hey yeah. that first game check's nice that first that signing bonus is awesome to have right but how much are you you know are you putting that you know an investment vehicle you know right, what are you right. what are you doing with that you know what are you doing with that money you know if you buy your mom a car and then you you know you buy yourself a new you know condo in the city man right. like you're paying property taxes yeah on two places put your boys you know, on a pj and go yeah, party man. somewhere for you know all so of a sudden there's 40 tough. g's it's tough, like, man. Yeah, yeah a lot a lot of like that type of stuff the financial uh, I guess readiness and education part of it. That's so, so, so hard um, as a young man being, yeah. actually being, you know, a young black man in your early twenties, man. That's sure. really tough. Well, that's really, really tough. I, I think, I don't know if it's Shaq. I forget who somebody always says like, you know, that most of these players don't even understand that, that, that they're barely even rich. Like they're certainly not even close to wealthy. Like the white dude who signs your check, that Easy. motherfucker is wealthy. <laughs> right. Like right, y'all right. boys are just like a little rich. Like a lot oh, of them, you right. know, the big stars obviously have a ton of money and, you know, basketball is even crazier with the sure. money, but like, um, anyway, rabbit hole, uh, definitely rabbit hole. I, it's a great I, one though, but yeah, it's a definite yeah. rabbit hole. Um, all right. So let's get into these prospects. We're going to start right off the top. We're going to go from kind of, we'll start at the best couple of guys and work through a couple of uh, tier one or two or three here. And then after we get past the first couple of guys, I don't think any of us necessarily have a firm grasp on how we would necessarily put them. But for the first couple of guys, I think we all feel a certain type of way about them. Sure. Um, so and, and real quick, Angelo, um, the yeah. way you do tiers, you don't necessarily just take all the guys and make a tier one, make a tier two, make a tier three. You have like criteria that have to be met to get into a certain tier of yours. Is that correct? Yeah. So how I'm, how I'm doing it this year, um, like before it was more so just, okay, I test overarching. What do I see? But now like I've, over the past two years, I've been trying to put my, I guess my thoughts on paper and put down, all right, what are the qualities that I look for, you know, being in the sport and human performance space, as well as looking at prospects through a holistic lens. Okay. Then I just put that on paper, finally finalized all of those. And now that's my grading system. And it's like, it's a pretty easy five point scale decimals included. Um, I won't get into it. It's pretty, you know, ton of details in it, but pretty much, if you are an elite level prospect, the higher the number. And so that's how you kind of get in look, tier one. But there may or may not be a prospect that fits in your tier one. No, for the, for there the might not. Like, right? In this given year, there is at the running back position. And there is, I think right now I have two at the receiver position. Um, but last year it was just, um, it was JT. two running backs. It was yeah. JT and um, JK Dobbins. Those are the two. Um in that first tier, I like Edward Hilaire a ton, but going back and grading like I, you know, like I do now, Edward Hilaire falls like in that second tier of player, which is fine, right? It's not a bad thing at all. Great second but, tier players last year for sure, but not yeah, not Jonathan Taylor, not right. J.K. Dobbins. Um, and so this year, my only tier one running back is Najee Harris. Um, 
he checks literally every single box that you could possibly imagine from a movement perspective. There you go. I had to do it to you. Fresh crack. Um, <laughs> but if you look at him play uh, at 230 pounds, the the thing that kind of sticks out is the fluidity, right? The the grace at his size, 6'2", 230. And, you know, he's running, he's running a wheel route downfield, you know, catching a pass over defender. Or, you know, he's being used, you know, I guess like on an outside zone run, he's cutting it back, making two guys miss. But the thing like that I love about watching Harris is just, he's just so well-rounded. He's everything you want in your modern day bell cow. He has the broadest receiving skill set that I've charted in this class. Him and Gainwell are kind of one and two in that regard, but he wins at all levels of the field as a receiver. That is really unique. And if you watched him in high school, I remember following him in high school because he was, he was probably the most, um, hyped running back prospect of this past decade and watching him in high school. I remember I was watching ESPN, you know how they do those like, um, ESPN features, yeah. features and do like, the, yeah. they do like one-on-ones and stuff for like mm-hmm. for camps. Um, and he was, he lined up at receiver against some of the best DBs in the nation. Absolutely cooked them. Yeah. And this is a guy at 6'2", 230. Right. He was a 200, he was a 218 right. pound high schooler. Have, I was going to say, he might not quite right. have been I mean, there at that still, point when you're still, talking about. But yeah. He's still a 6'1 and a half, 6'2", 218 pound high school yeah. running back. Right. And, you know, it's just the skill set that he has is very rare at his size in particular. And I just don't think there's a real hole in his game. He's just, oh, he's but Angelo, as Angelo, as Angelo, as if this guy was this good, how did he not have all the carries the entire time he was there? The, the analytical community is going to have such a problem with that. You know, what's interesting though. I think the one thing that I haven't heard anyone say, and which is what I think the biggest, one of the biggest reasons he came back is to work with Dr. Matthew Rio. Dr. Matthew Ree is the director of sports science at Alabama. I believe he got his job in March of 2020. He was formerly with Indiana. He is probably the smartest, most intuitive sports science mind in North America. There is a reason that Najee Harris, Jalen Waddell, and Devonta Smith's stock has soared this season. And it's, it partially is because of him. And that is why I think two of those guys, obviously um, Smith and Harris went back to school. You get a chance to work with someone who actually understands human movement in general, go ahead. um, And how to improve speed and power. And those qualities. I'm going to need a bathroom break in this thing. Probably. (laughs) Um, That's the important thing about having a guy like that, you know, in your back pocket and, you know, in your meeting rooms and, and being able to work with him on a day-to-day basis, that was important. And you saw it in his game. And it was funny when I charted um, Harris's junior season, he went from being a mid tier two running back to being a set it and forget it tier one player. Yeah. Like he is a, he, he goes into the potential all pro realm. Yeah, and that's the difference that I think um, Dr. Matthew Rhea made. And Matt Rhea is, a, I mean, look him up, brilliant guy. And, you know, that's a big, big piece of why I, I, I'm so, I feel so strongly about Najee Harris being so safe. Yeah, well, we'll, well, I think we're going to cap this thing off with at the end of this podcast with talking a little Devontae Smith. So I'll save Perfect. the conversation about him. We'll bring, uh, Rhea, was it Rhea? Yeah, that Matthew Rhea. We'll bring him back up uh, uh, then. It feels like Alabama. I agree with you. I, I got I got Najee up at up at number one. Um, I it seemed like they could have just literally given it given the ball to Najee Harris every snap of the game in one fashion or another. Probably. Still been one of the best teams in the country. Probably like yeah. he was he was just that good uh, this year and and really last year. He seems like he's plenty fast as well. Like some people knock mm-hmm. the speed a little bit, but he looks plenty fast to me. Like. Oh yeah, I mean he's he's ran Highest over. Justin speed score is going to be strong too, though. <laughs> yeah, two thirty. I mean it's it's funny because he has a faster clocked game speed than that of Miles Sanders. 
Yeah. Do with it as you will. Well, sure, sure. I'm not, saying he's than Miles. I'm not saying he's faster than Miles Sanders, but he is plenty fast. Yeah. And it shows. I mean, he you know, was, it, was a great offensive line this year at Bama. Um, and did obviously, you, did you see what's cast. his name? Brown waiting like at 364. <laughs> Just a mountain. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Those he's six three, so he's not even like yeah, a six not, six not six like, seven yeah, dude. A giant. Yeah. Like holy, that, that's a wide human being. That is yeah. a that is a literal refrigerator. That's yeah. unbelievable. Well, it's funny that you like you, you hit like some. Did you, did you call it elegance in this game? Is that what you went with? Is that fluidity? I think I said fluidity. Fluidity, and I think there was like another grace. Grace, there it is. I got him as a big, rugged dude, just this big manly it. man, like a like a black Paul Bunyan, if you will. I love it. Um, no, I, I love but it. But if if Paul Bunyan was teaching a class on what fucking <laughs> silverware to use at a fancy dinner, that is hilarious. That type of elegance in his game to go along with that big rugged seems like he could wear flannel everywhere. That's, that's uh, a great, that's a great description. I was talking to my buddy a couple nights ago when we were talking about the prospects in this class naturally. And he's like, what do you think of Najee here? It's like, how would you describe him? I'm like, all right, he is a bull wearing ballerina slippers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is him. He's, he's Paul Bunyan and babe in the blue ox. All mixed together. <laughs> all mixed together. Fun to watch, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a, just a, like you said, most big men like that, they seem so stiff. And I think Najee is the absolute different. Mm-hmm. Like, he seems oh, yeah. so pliable, like just yeah, very bendable human. And the stiff arm is nasty. Larry Holmes-esque, if you will. Not sure. sure. A former heavyweight champion beat Ali. But Ali was past his prime. He's from where I'm from. So I just I, I love it. When I'm throwing love the reference, references, good. I'm throwing, I'm throwing Larry in there. I'll, shout out to Larry Holmes, the Easton assassin. But yeah, man, I mean, the, I guess the, the other biggest knock on, on Najee is why, you know, one, why couldn't, why, why did he not beat out all, keep other guys off the field? And I think this Alabama has a ridiculous amount of talent. That's a stupid argument. And Simmons two, is old Two, Yeah. He'll be 23 in March. Well, that's the, that's the other not. And I was like, I don't, I don't even fucking care. Like <laughs> he runs I'm like good. he's 23. Like, that's for yeah, sure. Everybody hates running backs and they're old and you want to sell them by their second contract anyway. So well, why do I even care? This guy's awesome. I don't agree with that necessarily. I'm just saying like, that's what people, where people are at anyway. And it's like, he's got, he's awesome. He's like you said, he's that old Ronco, uh, said, I don't know if you guys remember that, uh, it was like an old infomercial that used to be on at like three in the morning. Oh, I love those. Night. Those, those are like the best. Every, you could cook best. everything in this thing. And the, the pitch was he would just hit the audience. He'd be like, and you said it and forget <laughs> it. And everybody would go nuts. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I'm all, I think I, I can't really find too many bad things to say about the guy, no. except for the people who hate on the age. Thoughts on the age? I, I mean, it's at a position though where it's, you're getting how many elite years for, and then it's anything after that's a bonus. Like if this is like a 23 year old wide receiver, we're talking about who you want to get eight to 10 years of legitimate production. I think then it's like, okay, like that, that's where it's a little different. Um, but even so, I mean, I'm just, I look at the player, you know, yeah. I'm not going to be an ageist. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is and you can't change his age. Right. Like you can't, you know, you can't <laughs> underdevelop, like you can't yeah. do that. Um, but I'm not too, I'm not worried about the age at all. Jay Wayne, do you have a problem with this? I have this, no problems. This, this Najee over ETN. No, Jay, Jay, I, I Jason went to Clemson. He's our Clemson guy. He does a okay job of staying remember, fairly man. neutral, but I try to stay nooch, uh, but it's tough. And if I'm on the clock at one, one, I mean, I'd like to say I could just move back to one, two, but then who knows who's going to take. I got to get a guarantee that you're taking Najee Harris with that one, one, if I move back and I probably would just take ETN because there's no way I could pass on him. But I try to I try to stay unbiased when I am on this show and I'm telling people what I think. If I was you, I would probably have to take Najee Harris, and I'm totally fine with that. And and we have teams that we share together and stuff, and I'm probably going to get outvoted. Uh, we do have one draft where we uh, we traded somebody and, and they got the one once so we have their pick and we're going to have to decide whether we want ETN and Harris. I'm probably going to lose that vote and I'm not going to be upset at all about having Harris on the team. He's pro- he's he's a safer prospect, I guess, than ETN in, in, in some ways. Um, 
But I mean, I agree with everything you guys said about Najee. He's incredible to be so big and powerful and fluid at the same time with the speed and the change of direction. And then you throw on top of that, the fact that he can go high point, a back shoulder fade and contort his body at the same time. Like, it's just incredible what that man can do on a football field. Don't care at all about the age. Don't care about the lack of production prior to the last year. Good for him for coming back getting that massive workload, showing everybody, and then drastically improving his draft stock, I would imagine. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Especially with how deep last year's class was. So I have no problems with any of this. Um, uh, Najee Harris, how can you argue with that, man? Word. All right, let's springboard right into I think that's your end of Tier 1, Angelo. Yeah, that's it. Najee Harris is the only only back I, I have in Tier 1 personally okay. this year. Okay, I'm not again. I don't think we're quite on the necessary necessarily uh, the tier breakdown. I, I think I would still slide ETN into tier one with Najee Harris right now as things stand. But we we got a long way to go on before we're saying we feel really good about uh, what right. we're saying. Um, so Travis ETN is, is is his biggest downfall right now being great for so long. Like it just seems like that's something that when you're this good for that long, people start to just nitpick and discredit like you've seen it a million times with quarterbacks be great stay too long and then the next year not be good and it's like oh that guy sucks and sometimes maybe they figured him out travis etn there's no figuring him out he's fantastic um it, w- what do you think about travis etn angelo i think he's the easiest prospect in this class to fall in love with i mean you watch him play i mean he's the best accelerator we've seen at the position since chris johnson i mean that's an that's an absolute fact the guy's phenomenal during early acceleration but there are major gaps in his game and major flaws. And that's the part of me that's like, okay, like, where does he, where does he really sit? The reason why I don't have him in the same tier as Harris is from a holistic standpoint, there's a lot he doesn't do very well at all. He struggles through direct contact. Like I think um, someone put out this thread too. It's really, really interesting. Um, but he turns his shoulders. I was just reading that, and that's it's poppy. How, how you can be mad about him avoiding contact? You know, I didn't quite agree with that thread. I think you're talking about. I think it's no. I, I think he. It's not that he avoids struggles avoiding direct contact. I think he struggles through direct contact. I think how he manages it. I think is like the way I interpret um, what he's doing. Not just that thread. I thought that thread was really interesting. Well, because he had some clips on that thread, right? And and uh, and I forget the guy's name. I hadn't really. It's a Dynasty Nerds guy or something like that. He has it on his little uh, profile. I can't yeah. remember the guy's name. I think it was John John um John Helmkamp, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thought it was really. I thought it was interesting. I mean, well, not that I agree with all where, of it, but yeah, where he was spinning through the, you know. Not not going through contact like you said, and it was like I looked at that clip and I was like, he just avoided a big hit, and the guy was trying to say he was going to take a big hit, and I was like, he just avoided a big hit. I, I was kind of confused on watching. It's really that. interesting because a guy like Etn, who is so good during early acceleration, needs to stay square to use his speed as power. Right? That's the it, he does it all the time, and he takes unnecessarily big shots because of it. And that's something that I see consistently throughout his game. Is that something he can't clean up? No, he can, he can definitely clean that up once he gets to the NFL. But the bigger part of the game that I think is tough is he's a pretty unnatural receiver of the football, right? Him coming back, that was the biggest point he wanted to improve upon. I think he did. He got better as a pass catcher. I can say nothing about the pass catching. Like he's fine. He's good. Yeah. He, is he, I mean, is he, is he line up not... in the slot and draft him as being a fantastic receiver? No, that's probably not what you're doing, but that's not what you're doing with a lot of running backs. He's no. got so many other talents. Like the only other person who caught more balls with him was Jaquarius Marks this year. And he was at Mississippi state and he caught 60, I think ETN right. caught 48 right. or something like that. And, literally Mississippi state does not run the football. Like no, they just throw it a million times. And, no. and ETN doesn't had play. 12.3 a catch. Like and that's a huge right. part of his game at moving forward is that now you can, now there is an advantage of like, Hey, I don't need him to be the best route runner. I just need him to be able to go out nowhere to be in the space, catch the ball and do what he does. Right. Exactly. I think for me, you know, it's just, he doesn't have a developer out tree. It's very much like you said, like you get your yards after the catch and that's fine. Right. And as long as he's functional in that area, but if he struggles as a receiver, are you going to be surprised? No, I'm not. But he has made strides in that area, and I think that's an area for me that you know you, you did see growth, and that's important. Um, I like him as a prospect. I think he's 
one of those guys that if he gets in the right situation, he's absolutely going to smash. Like if he goes to San Francisco um, and Shanahan's wide zone scheme, that's fantastic. But he's going to be pretty landing spot dependent because he doesn't decelerate very well. He he's pretty poor laterally. He's very much a north and south. He's a north and south runner. He sees a gap. He hits the gap, and he's you look down the field, and he's fifty yards down. Right? That's who he is. Is that a bad thing? No, but that's just who he is as a player. And knowing his strengths, weaknesses is important because if he does go to one of those landing spots that, that do implore wide zone and, and that's going to be a big part of it. He could, he could literally be, he has the highest, he has a, he has the moon and he has the basement in terms of his ceiling and floor. The floor isn't great with him. I don't believe, Mm. but the ceiling is the moon. And that's why you're buying ETN at like one, one, three to one, four, one, five, because of the ceiling. Yeah, there's, there's zero chance I'm not buying them at one two for me. Um, yeah, and I I kind of disagree with the floor. I think I think yeah, there's got to be somewhat of a floor here. I mean, uh, real quick, I'll, I'll let you get into it. But I think the difference between Harris and Etn for me is that Harris definitely is a is not landing spot dependent at all. Where Et's absolute ceiling definitely is a little more team dependent, and that's really kind of where i'm just drawing the line i'm not for sure but i I agree with jay wayne sorry to cut you off there i don't i don't think there's a basement and i think he'll be just like he's good enough that he's gonna be able to figure out how to make your day in one play every pretty much every sunday i i think he could i think i think it's definitely i think that's definitely a possibility but it's gonna be when right it's gonna be right off the bat in the nfl it certainly could be it could be or is he gonna see like a miles sanders type ascension where he struggles for the first five six weeks yeah, but and that's yeah, okay. that, they're completely different play. Like that's that's actually that's a okay. great point that I wanted to bring up is like Miles Sanders. You watch him in college, and all he's doing is relying on his athletic ability to to bounce basically every run outside. And when you watch Travis Etienne play, and he's just he's just taking whatever angle is 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 fastest, right? He's not he doesn't rely on his athletic ability to just constantly bounce runs outside. And now I hear everybody talking about how he has no lateral agility and it's like i don't know that he doesn't have any he just never needs to use it because he's so the the acceleration and the anticipation like he's just he's not an ankle breaker he's an angle breaker because there's no angle you can take to him to 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 bring him down And, and yet i'll give you this when he gets to the second level there are times when he could use a little bit of lateral ability to maybe make that guy miss. But half the time he does make that guy miss anyway, because sure. he's moving so fast and he, and he uses that power to just, he's like, I'm either going to get a few more yards here or I'm going to bust you off and then keep going. And he, and he yeah. you know, he's so electric. Um, and, and, and reading stuff, I read, you know, I read your thread on the, on the, um, the Angelo analysis.com uh, who's next. Right. And you were talking about, you know, how he's got a lot of nuances to his game. You use the word nuance a lot. You know, there's lean, there's a slight, the slight lean that he gives you. And then, but then the thing that really stood out to me was the dramatic shifts of torque, right? That's yeah. what describe what I'm seeing that I didn't know how to, I couldn't put those words together, but you, that's yeah. such a beautiful string of words, dramatic shifts of torque. And I feel like that comes into play when when he's going through contact because he he can just ski ski yeah. out of the, and, out of that thing and that's the that's a big thing with him is he can do that and he that's one of the parts of the game that's super unique right like for him like his through contact skill set is he has such he's a, he has incredible balance when he not, is not accelerating balance, yeah when he is accelerating before that like during before early accelerating, like the line of scrimmage you don't see that same type of balance right but when he's moving when he's accelerating and he gets hit he can roll off tackles and and that stuff he does and getting into acceleration after that and re-accelerating tremendous tremendous job there the i think it's so tough to kind of see without knowing where he lands um because it's you know it's it's tough with ETN because he he's so athletically gifted during acceleration, but laterally either you didn't see much, or he doesn't have much. He doesn't. He didn't need to use it. That would be my. See, argument. that's the thing. But we don't know vehemently which one which one those which one that is. 
I don't, I think it's a combination too. I don't think he has a ton. He does not offer a ton laterally, but he also did not need to, he but, didn't need to use it in cares? But who cares? Like, right. uh, how much where does he that has, matter? He has that elite, like we would absolutely, we crushed that. We crushed, people crushed David Montgomery because he did too much. It's too much. It's too much of too this. Much it's too much of this. Too much dancing. Every time he does something, we crush Miles Sanders. We crush this guy. We crush that guy because they do that shit too much. Like I would rather have a guy like ETN who knows what he does. He accelerates, right. like you said, at the one of the most elite levels we've seen in right. a very long time. Put your foot in the ground and go. And like, like Jay Wayne said, like, he fucks your geometry up. Like, <laughs> like that's, that's what he does. And yeah, is, is he going to be your between the tackle grind it out? Is he a power no. running back? Does he need to be in a power scheme? No, certainly not. And, and I mean, why would anybody draft him to do that? That would be stupid. Like, right. why would you, why would you put him in that position? Like, that's not what you do. That's not what he does. Right. Um, and right. I just, I just feel like I would rather have a guy who knows what he does and uses his skill set to his advantage rather than just, um, uh, saying kind of going back to the miles sanders and uh, like just it's, it's always it relied so many on jump cuts and moving around and then just being like i'm the best athlete on the field you know try and stop me i'm gonna just keep doing all this nonsense where he just puts etn just puts his foot in the ground and goes and yeah i he, i kind of compared him a little bit to when daryl henderson was coming out it's i didn't similar, like yeah. i didn't like daryl henderson's second level agility like it seemed like he ran into contact a lot of the times right. um and i think etn's that's probably the worst part of his game, but ETN's contact balance is better and his acceleration yeah. is probably better. So, you know, sometimes he, he if you if you're not, oh, rapping, if you're not wrapping him, Henderson, he's running through that arm tackle. Right. Yeah. Um, he's a, he's a fan. Like I said, he's a fantastic prospect. I mean, I, I think uh, he's someone who has an extremely, extremely high ceiling and it's because of his ability as an accelerator. I'd like to see some of those other qualities come up um, and well, see, you know, a little more, I guess, tactical nuance to his game adding some more, you know, to his toolbox. But I mean, he's going to be a guy who's going to be a late day one, early day two pick, you know, right. he's going to have the capital. Um, but the only really question is where is he landing and how much volume does a guy like that get? Right. He is so explosive. You don't want to run a guy like that into the ground with 18 touches a game. You don't. Mm, and uh, that's the tough thing. That's going to be the tough thing. If he doesn't contribute much as a receiver, um, whether it's via scheme or ability, that's going to be hard. See, see, to me, that would just be the, the coaching. That would be a coaching issue. Like why, why in the world? You've seen not it be, before. Well, well oh, yeah. of course, of course. And I'm not, I'm not saying oh, yeah. that anybody is, 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 I mean, look at Jonathan Taylor for half the season. Like, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, no, no usage for, for any stretch of the imagination. And he was, everyone hated him as a receiver. And then all of a sudden he was like the most efficient receiver for as far as, you know, drops catching the ball um, as any of the running backs out on the field. And I just, it would be silly for you not to get him involved in the passing game is I always, I always have a problem. I always have a problem with the, with the running back catching thing. Like anybody who's an elite athlete and isn't one of those guys who's an asshole off the field, you can learn how to fucking catch the football. Like that's not, that's a learnable trait. And you saw that you saw that happen, the progression with ETN. I mean, even in 19, he had a ton of catches, but this year they really made an effort to showcase him in the, in the, in the passing game. And I thought he excelled well, um, and obviously when he gets the ball in his hands, he knows what to do with it. Um, I, let me argue a little bit for your floor. You like this Angelo, um, for the floor of ETN anyways, is that he's a high character guy. Like he, he, all he cares about is working like in, and he doesn't, he never talks about himself. Like he doesn't like people will come up to him on like at school and stuff and be like, yo, you know, you broke this record and you have all these. And he like, he doesn't even know, like he doesn't care. He wouldn't even bring it up. He doesn't want to talk about it. Like he, he's just about the work sure. and like the culture and doing the right thing. And this dude is just, he's just a beast. And to, to have somebody that talented, be that grounded. I think, I think something to definitely take note of, like we talked about earlier uh, in the beginning of the show. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely, you know, it's, that's huge, right. Um, having, you know, that type of character um, as you go through the ups and downs of being an NFL player is important. Um, the floor isn't a for talent that's for opportunity. That That's for schematics. That's for yeah. where you get drafted. That's the difference is he's not versatile enough to go to all 32 NFL teams and sure, make I agree, the same I agree. and make the same impact. But, but that's I the think, only reason why I have Harris. Exactly. Uh, uh, and definitely that, and ahead of him. And that's the, diff, I mean, there's a, to me, there's a, there's a, 
litany of differences between the two as players. Player styles. Yeah. But stylistically, they're different. But ETN can he can have 11 touches, 200 yards in a game. Mm-hmm. That's him, right? Yeah. That's him as a player. Where he goes is going to really dictate his early yeah. career success. But I also can't see, you know, you said you didn't like maybe riding him into the ground 18 touches, but if you're going to draft him at first or second overall, I do think that I, there's no, I don't think there's any reason not to give him that many touches. I would want to give him that many touches. Like, cause it's it just, depends. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's what you want to do with running back position. I mean, either, you know, it's either you incorporate a committee yeah, or you have a bell cow. Like, yeah. like James Robinson asked, like right. now Jonathan Taylor, hope he will be next sure. year, that type of thing. But because their skill set doesn't rely, they they have another basically like they they have another toolbox basically they, mm-hmm. they they can do that and rely on not just the accelerative capabilities because that's who ETN is man I mean he if he he's a hole gone he's not going to create a hole for himself that's the only thing that's going to be tough early on in his career is he's going to have to learn to create in his own that's will fair, he I don't know fair, depends fair-ish. Yeah. Depends on the environment he goes to. Um, but, you know, it dep- well, I, don't, like, I don't have the PFF the uh, numbers in front of me, but I know there is a lot of yards after contact for sure. Uh, primarily in 19. Um, oh, the yards after. Yeah, for sure. The yards after. But I'm, I'm saying like at line of scrimmage, like. Right. Like manipulating defenders, gain the second level with not just the singular quality, but. He is a very good prospect. I can un- and understand is, that line of thinking at least. And is deserving of being a late first round pick for a team that wants to make a splash the position. All right. Well, there was some there was a talk about committee and bell cow, but I think there's another player later on here that's gonna spurn a little bit more of that conversation. So I don't want to dive back into that. Cool. Um Hit us, hit us with the, is there, so is there another person in the next t- in the same tier with ETN and, and, and is there more than one guy or is this one, one more guy in it for the tier? I know you said you weren't fully done with your tiers or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. I'm. It's not complete yet, but from what I've gathered right now, there's two, I think it's um, Javante Williams and Kenneth Gainwell. I think okay. it's funny when you look at all three of those guys, ETN Gainwell Williams, all three are vastly different players. Yeah. win in vastly different ways. But the one thing is they all win with a trait that is near elite or elite. That's important. Elite, elite yes. Right? And that's important, right? Well, so, well, go ahead. Go, no, no, go ahead. I'll let you finish. I'll let you no, finish. No, 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 go ahead. Do that. I just, I was going to say, what, what do you, what is the elite trait for uh, Javante Williams? But fin- finish your. Oh, I'll, I'll, that, that's exactly what I was going to bring okay. up next. With okay. Williams, it's, it is the, th- like, through contact. He is an absolute hammer. He is an energy giver. He is a guy that you want to develop your offensive identity around because of how hard the kid plays. And he has good feet. Um, he does a lot of little things well, but man, he's a tough out as a tackle. I mean, yeah. that is what he power run scheme, Seattle, you know, if that type where, you know, that's what it is. You know, you are getting the ball downhill and you're going to be the short yardage guy. You know, you're going to be scoring a lot of touchdowns. Um, Buffalo is another place I think he'd fit really well into. Um, yeah. Take some, take some, you know, some help out to get some help on Josh Allen at the goal line. If um, you're not super uh, plugged into everybody going on and maybe you don't know anything about Javante Williams, 5'10", 220, 225 ish uh, from UNC, was in a fantastic ecosystem. Um, love it. The 2020, the 2016 or the 2019 uh, numbers are, are pretty good, but the 2020 numbers are, are really good. Um, and he's, he's a really fun guy to watch. No, yeah, he's awesome. Pl- First plays in the angry. ACC in yeah. rushing, um, third in the NCAA in rushing, third in. Um, yeah, so. I do what, have what the, I do have the PFF uh, stats for his uh, yards after contact. He led the, or no, he was second in the nation last year with 4.6 yards after contact. And he averaged. 0.48 broken tackles per attempt. So he was he was breaking half a tackle every attempt, which was which what PFF said that was a record that they'd had. Now yeah. my I question think he averaged I think he averaged a touchdown every 8.2 touches too or something crazy. Yeah, they're they're I mean him and Michael Carter were unbelievable. 
Yeah. I mean, what was, that was going on there? What, what was that? Combination of scheme, run blocking, and two very good running backs. Was there like a whole like circle of things that was going on there? Was it like a symbiotic relationship of? Hey, I don't know, man, but it was crazy like to watch. The conglomerate of the team and the environment That's that they crazy. were all in. It was, uh, what, do what, you would you, what would you, what would be another name for that? Oh man. <laughs> uh, it was a good environment. That's what it was. Ah, it was you're, you're holding out on us. <laughs> Ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem was the word we were looking for there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, yeah. Coach him. He was holding out. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. You brought, you brought up, uh, or I'm interested. You brought up Buffalo, right? Because, you know, my, yeah. my question with Javante was like, you know, you look at that run versus, um, man, to Miami, oh, Miami, right? That run yeah. was so ridiculous. And Dude, thinking, that was like, nuts. Is he gonna be able to do this against, you know, the the, the NFL players? Because there certainly wasn't anybody in the ACC. They could tackle him, but like, does that, can you knock him because he was playing in the ACC? And then I think about Devin Singletary and how he wasn't playing against anybody any good, but he was breaking mad tackles with a less athletic skill set than uh, Javante has, but still breaking a bunch of tackles against inferior talent. Do you knock him at all for that or you just, no? No, man. I think it's like Dave Montgomery. Look at that. I mean, look at him at Iowa State in the, you know, Big 12. I mean, Like everybody said the same thing. He's not going to break that many tackles in the NFL level, but you know, you have to look at it in terms of two years, right? You look at it from their first year in the NFL and their second, the jump that Dave Montgomery made in terms of his play style, excuse me, getting more North and South and actually using his skill set, like that he had in college with breaking tackles and yards after contact and, as the bears offensive line improved, he improved obviously, but I think he can, there's nothing indicating that he can't. Um, He has that motor that you like in that energy giving um, my running back's going to make you feel it for all four quarters. That's, that's who he is. And I think NFL teams are going to like that. He, the Atlanta Falcons with Arthur Smith would be my first choice for him. That would be great fantastic you just run it down their throat for four quarters and we have julio jones and calvin Ridley on the outside and and matt ryan dishing the rock i mean that's the type maybe. of uh, hopefully i mean actually doesn't doesn't like maybe maybe not i mean yeah. maybe it's wilson you don't know but yeah he's gonna be a guy who's in a immediately coming into command 15 to 20 touches a game now see so there's like another question i have about this guy is like he never i think he had in 19 he had 166 attempts and that's the most he he was right. sharing a lot of that workload with carter and it's like can, who well, all the way you, by the way you might met, like carter with the other running back in that ecosystem was annihilating it as well <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's like this is like a pump free uh, penny. penny situation. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's a good. I like the historical. The historical good comparison. ecosystem comparisons. But I, do you I, have I any? It's nice. Do you have any qualms about him not having shouldered a full three down load even in college and and, and then going into the pros? Do you think he can handle twenty carries a game? Uh, when he's never uh, seen that type of work before. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Jay. But I think for me, it's more um, look at it like Antonio Gibson. Right. He had under 30 carries in college. Well, no, if there's an outlier, that's an I, outlier. But what I'm, yeah, but like it, it, I don't think that, we love Antonio Gibson, or at least I, we do. I, yeah. So I don't think that really, I don't think I'm, at least me personally, I'm not concerned about him struggling, shouldering that workload. Um, I think if the frame was maybe a little different on this guy, he it certainly might has the frame. I, I think, yeah, I mean, he's not like a 198 pound back who's going to be getting 20 touches. Um, you know, he's a 222 pound guy. So yeah, with, with impressive skills. I mean, he's got like, hey, he's, he's got player. some bend, like he's got that. What, what is it? Is it, I think Matt Wallman called it some curvy linear movement. Where curvy he's linear. Like, oh yeah. That's right? the, Von, you, that's the Vonta Smith calling card right there. Unbelievable curve linear mover. Would you say that Javante save it? Also, he's at the end. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> just, we'll, we'll go back and just erase that whole. <laughs> no, no, yeah. it's all good. No, no, it's um, all good. I'm playing, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's his ability to not lose speed when he's just not, we call cutting, you know, not the hard plants, but just changing course at 222 pounds. That's hard to do. Yeah. So I think he does it really well. He's, he's a good football player. Yeah. Well, yeah. Smooth, fast catcher. Yeah. This guy's yeah, checking. Just, 
Good, good average. I think it's ETN average average pass catcher will make his money after the catch. And that is fine. He's not a receiver. He's a pass catcher. You don't have to be Najee Harrison, Kenneth Gainwell to have success as a receiver. Look at Chris Carson this year when healthy getting and Russell was cooking, throwing throwing through the ball. There was plenty of games where his receiving was what, what did it for you? And it wasn't yeah. anything sexy, but he gets the ball. He's losing right. he's dudes over. I mean, if you're on the field for 85% of the snaps, yeah. you're probably going to get three targets, four targets. Right. right. And, and that's really, to me, any bell cow back. That's all like, that's all you need to be fine on the season for catching the ball. Look at James you know? Robinson, J- right. James Robinson out of Kyle's. Was he a spectacular receiver out of Illinois state? No, pretty average. Um, yeah. But you know, he was, a great receiver this year. He right. was great out of the backfield. He made one really nice play at the end of the season. I forgot who they're playing, but it was like a back shoulder ball. I was, it was pretty sweet, but I mean, yeah. hit, you know, players grow, they develop. Sure. So, I mean, and, and that's something that we're going to see with all these guys like ETN and Williams and the rest of this class. Like the, these guys all have question marks or more question marks. than obviously you got like Najee Harris, in my opinion, but those questions can be answered and yeah. over time. We'll probably see some of them get answered. And there's, right. there's some other checks that I like. And I think I, I got a little bit of a pool of where, what he looks like on the field and where he gets his stuff from. Like this guy is a valid Victor or valedictorian of his high school class. Right. Uh, so smart guy. Love that. He's never, ever late. He's always early. Um, so just, he's got the character, well-spoken dude. Um, and then the story of this guy is that he was a linebacker all through yes. high school. And yes. then he switched yeah. to running back because he wasn't getting any looks because he wasn't as big as he was right now. And he was a smaller linebacker. His coach was quoted as saying that if he played at Hoover high school, which is a big high school in Alabama, yeah. uh, he would be able to go anywhere he wanted essentially. Uh, but he wasn't getting those looks. So he switched to running back. He was thinking about quitting football his senior year. He only played running back for a very short amount of time. Um, and then he was getting some some traction, but he really wanted to go to UNC. Um, so he ends up playing. Larry Fedora comes to a game. He ends up crushing it uh, at the running back position and ends up getting his dream of going to UNC. Just grinder is not going to give up on his dreams. Parents are super encouraging to, hey, no, this, this is what you want to do. Do it. Let's go get it. Um, but I think the big story here is that is that he did play linebacker. And to me, when he put that's what gives him his edge on the right. other side of the field, because he plays sort of like a linebacker at yeah. the running back position. He has instead of the target going from, hey, let's find the guy with the ball, read, react and explode. Now it's like the targets, the end zone, read, react and explode into the end zone. And I think that that linebacker mentality, that heat seeking kind of mentality that he carried as a linebacker, I think that that really translates over to that. When I read that and then I went back and watched some more stuff, I was like, that's it. Like that's he has that linebacker mentality and and the and the way he's playing the game. And then on top of that, there's other levels cooked in of like he he's at least has intuition of what those guys are thinking and how they would play it. So there's, there's so many things going on that I think that that, that linebacker position really sculpted his game into what you're seeing on the field. Yeah. I guess I think you're spot on. I mean, I think it's, you know, the mentality and the motor that he has is, you know, it, you, you can see it. And that's right. I mean, an NFL, an NFL offensive corner is going to, you know, light up, if they're, you know, if you're on the clock in the early second round and he's still on the board, like yeah. he's going to be a guy that all 32 teams are going to want on their team. I think the, I don't know, I can, Atlanta's a great landing spot, but honestly, Philadelphia would be a really nice spot for him because I think that thunder lightning tandem of, I think Miles Sanders needs a running mate for one. Um, I think with his durability issues and, you know, some of the inconsistencies we've seen, I think he needs someone that he can feed off of Boston. Scott's not that guy. Yeah. Um, and he would just smash there because he really would, doesn't have an identity. I mean, uh, they don't. And he would break so many hearts if he went there. We so thought, many hearts. But they, everyone thinks that, that Miles Sanders is just saved now. Doug Peterson's out of there. He's going to be a bell cow. Or somebody else is going to come in there and he's going to go right back to sort of running back I think back the writing was on the wall when they were – Roseman and Peterson wanted to take J.K. Dobbins. Yeah. That's when, it, it that's just, when, I'm, that's when you're like, okay – they want a like a legitimate second tandem. back there. Yeah. Right. 
and that I guess not a knock on Sanders. It just no, that's how they want to play. Where we football. are. That's where we are in they the NFL play, that's for the most part. Play football. Like right. you don't it's so hard to find a bell cow back that you know, look at Zeke Elliott. Like, man, like five, four or five years removed. He he doesn't look like the same player he did three years ago, does he? No. But that's what you get when you yeah. when you give a guy the ball that much for that amount of time is you want fresh legs, you want you want playmakers, and um, in their early to mid second round, Williams is going to be one of the top players on the board for sure. Yeah, I, I, I just going back to that linebacker thing. I think he plays with that mentality. He's got yep. enough wiggle. He's got yep. the strength. He's got the tenacity to break tackles consistently, and I like exploding into that contact. And just people don't want it with him a lot of times. Right. And then he he has the explosion and enough wiggle to to keep it moving. And then one more last thing on the character, yeah, like sure. love it that in that Florida state game, which I lost money on, um, <laughs> they were getting their absolute ass kicked. He scores a touchdown. And instead of like, there's nothing worse than a team and somebody getting their ass kicked and having no awareness of the situation. Like, Hey, we're fucking getting drug out here. He handed the ball right back to the ref and walks over to the sideline. A couple of his homies come over and jump kind of on him, but he's just like, ah, here's the ball. We got work to do. Like this is, yeah. This is, uh, and I fuck, I love that kind of stuff. Love like, the workman's attitude, man. Right. It's huge. He was infectious too. It's yeah. infectious. That's how the, I mean, honestly, we won't be talking this before the show too, but I'll bring it up again is the Bears of Dave Montgomery down the stretch. He was their engine. Not because he's some all pro caliber talent on the football field. No, because he, he, he cares. Right. Like he gives a shit. Like that's, right. that's a big part of it. Right. Yeah, and it, go back to his character and it's off the fucking chart. Same thing. Eagle Scout. Like that is right. who yeah. he is. And that is very similar to the character of Williams. And that means a lot to, you know, NFL offensive coordinators, GMs, head coaches, whatever, you, you know, whatever you name it. Um, it's a big it deal. It doesn't mean a lot I, to some stubborn uh, fantasy people, but that it means right. the world to me. So that that's a great point. That's just, you took the words right out of my mouth. A lot of dynasty Twitter people don't care about that stuff, but he is getting a ton of hype right now. Like if we were on the Price Is Right and we're looking to the audience for a suggestion, they're all screaming Javante. Like the whole right. crowd is screaming Javante, and I just and 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 in the same manner, like everybody's just starting to hate on ETN. And, and, and now well, you're kind a of, bunch of people moving Javante over ETN. That's kind of where my statement of like, if, if like, if, and why? If ETN, <laughs> ETN's tough. greatness for so long, I think it's, it's starting to hurt him because he's just been like, you're just like, you're over it. You're like, oh, Javante's the new flavor of the week. It's, like, and it, it's not, it I'm not hating on Javante. I think, I don't know. I think, I think that's a very, Jay, that's a really valid question. And it's interesting because for me, like charting them, like pretty close. Like I have Williams a little higher because the touchdown potential is a lot greater. I think the volume potential is a lot greater, but it's a, it's a volume based position. Um, But I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, you could, it doesn't matter who's where they're both good football players. Like, so it's, you know, like you're splitting hairs at that point, but both are both are deserving of second round draft capital. And I think that's what really matters. It's not where we have them. How does the NFL value these guys? Yeah. And like I th- that's I, the most important. It is. It is very important. But but there is also sometimes that that's taken too far. I think like sometimes it, it sure. matters. It matters until it doesn't. Sure. It, I think, it, it matters for oppor- for chances to continue to that. Hey, you fucked up or you weren't that good. You'll continue to get more grace and longevity of turning it around and being good. Whereas, you mean capital wise. Yeah. Capital wise. No, whereas, yeah, I, if you I, don't, I agree. If you I don't have that, then, then your leash you have is a lot short. Longer. Right. Exactly. Your leash so I think is that's longer. the biggest part of that. And I, I do think obviously I'm not anywhere near as smart as people in the NFL, but people in the NFL fuck it up too. So, <laughs> Very know. true. There was a kicker taken in the second round, not too long ago. Right. So yeah. Right. Well, right. I mean, just look at the Eagles and I'm not hating on Jalen Rager, but I mean, you could have had Justin Jefferson. And then meanwhile, the Vikings are in their draft room laughing. They're like, ha! I saw that. That was, get that Justin was... Jefferson. what are we doing? Like, that was and tough. I'm not hating on Jane, Jalen Rager. He may turn out to be great. Like I'm, I'm not, I liked him a lot, Jaylen but Rager. yeah, that's, that's a, yeah. At the moment, what are the Raiders? The Raiders continuously fuck this up. Like, how do you not take CD Lamb or? I mean, yeah, it's tough, man. What I mean, are you doing just... taking rugs? Like, yeah. Anyway, all right. Yeah. So you have Gainwell as the next guy. Yeah. Um, 
Hit for us him, with some gain well. He's probably just he's the second best receiver. You could argue that he's the best receiver at the running back position in this class, and I wouldn't I wouldn't bat an eye at it. I mean, he's he's phenomenal. I'd probably put him as the best. Great in yeah, great in space. Um offers a ton down the field and a ton in the slot. And that's going to be the interesting thing. He's going to be a pretty movable chess piece for offensive coordinators. Um, I don't think that he is going to command 12 to 15 carries a game. I think it's going to be less than that. I think it's going to be more of a, you know, he might see a James White in his prime target share. That might be the, you know, that might be the, um, I guess the appeal to gain well is he is a good runner, but you know, he's, 190 yeah, to 198 say, pounds. I mean, he's not, are, he, yeah, he's not, you know, he's five. Oh, I think he's five, 10 and a half, five, 11, about 195 ish pounds. Yeah. So if um, you're not familiar with him, he's from Memphis. Yeah. He's five, 11, 190 ish, maybe a little yeah. more. I could see him. He took the year off because of COVID. Uh, yeah, he, he had, was one of the first had, guys out. He had three yeah. family members. Yeah, I think three, passed, yeah, away, passed from away from it. It's crazy, man. Um, yeah. So just Hard a little thoughts. bit of uh, background crazy. at Gainwell. I could see him coming into something like a combine, maybe closer to a 200 at a spec, yeah. like just trying to put yeah. on as much weight as he can. And then going back down because uh, that's his play speed is what makes him. Uh, oh yeah. He's fantastic. no, he's, he's a good player, man. He's a darn good player. Um, I think it's one of those, you know, for the fantasy appeal, it's PPR. Like you're <laughs> like James, what dude, Tariq Cohen was RB what 11, like two yeah. years ago. Like, come on. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot there's a lot to unpack here with him I think and I think I think he has the potential to be in this tier for me but I think he would end up being a tier right I think he's the for me he's the bottom of he's the bottom right. of this tier so for so I wanted to ask you about that so tier two you were saying that there, there's like elite qualities to their game what what would you say his elite quality is just like the versatility and the receiving yeah his receiving skill set I think that's one of the like when I charted him, it's, you know, watching the games and seeing, Hey, like, where does he win? Like how often does he win? Like, He's so confident with that huge. ball in the air. Dude. Like, that's the thing is you don't get that from running backs. I mean, it's, you know, like there's very, it's very seldom when you get a running back, you just put him in a slot and you know, okay, he's a legitimate threat there. Like yeah. guys like Camara McCaffrey, like that's the level that he could be on one day in terms of his receiving capabilities. I don't know. He's not going to be those guys as runners and between the tackles, especially um, that's not him, but as a pure receiving threat, he's fantastic. Right. Uh, top, top shelf, top of the class at that regard. I do wonder yeah. about his pl- pass protection a little bit. It seems like yeah, but that's not gonna diagnosing be. blitzes and he's not really chip. He's like quick to chip, which to be a third down back, sure, you yeah. have to pick that kind of stuff up. So I could see that being a little bit of a struggle for him. Yeah, I think, it, I think it might be. Yeah, it's a great point. I think it might be. Um, but I think we saw in this, in the, in the AFC championship game, uh, one thing I was watching a lot was Clyde Edwards Hilaire's maturation as a pass protector. Right. He had, a, uh, again, he had some really good blitz pickups. You can learn just like receive. I was just about to say, just like catching a things. football. This is a, this is a yeah. learnable trait. It's, it's, it's a learn, it's a teachable, learnable trait. And, and there's uh, a willingness to it yeah, as well. Exactly. You gotta have to want to do it. And I was really impressed with Edward Solaire's ability to do so. And that was one of the big knocks I'm coming out of LSU was, Hey, he, he wasn't asked he, to pass. He, he can't, he, he can't, he, he's not good at it. And he wasn't asked to do it. So, excuse me, but he, um, I, he did a great job in the NFC championship game. Keep him homes clean. Uh, he didn't play as much because of the injury, but right. when he was on the field and was asked to do it, he did a he did a much better job than he did earlier on in his rookie season. And that's what we could see with Gainwell is like the ascension of those qualities, um, just giving him time to grow and learn and mature yeah. as a like holistically as a player is important. Um, but I I mean the kid's a dynamic receiver, dynamic in the open field, yeah. And he's better he's a better than you give him credit for a rusher as well. I agree. Sure, I mean, he's like one of the few players ever to rush for a hundred yards in a game and have 200 receiving Dude, yards unbelievable. in the same game. It's crazy. Um, and he's, he's pretty fast. He was hitting home runs. I don't yeah. think that he has elite deep speed. Like he is, he, he does seem like he's going to get caught. Good play speed. Nothing, nothing really to write home about. I mean, it's, he's not ETN. Um, you know, he's probably, if you, you know, people listening probably want like a 40s, probably like a low four or five guy. Yeah. Not yeah. bad. 
Like yeah. good, above average, but not like great. But to be that small, it's a little bit of a knock to not be super. You want him to be super fast, but he's not quite there. But I think it's the the more so the like early acceleration. He's good there. Yeah, but the top yeah. end top end speed's a cherry on top in the NFL. The running back position, yeah, and, and, and and it's not his it's not. isn't bad, and I think the play speed no. is better than the what the maybe the run like the oh yeah, his play speed's better than his his play speed better than his time speed, and you see yeah. it all the time in the NFL. Like, dude, Kareem Hunt was like a four six two guy, right? Like, he doesn't play like a four and, six two guy. And Kareem Hunt isn't over overly large either. Like, no. he's not a, a big he's big like guy. Two fifteen, he's two fifteen, two eighteen. Yeah, like that. he's perfect. I think he came in at, in the. Closer to the two ten, he was like two twelve, maybe. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, he's not. I, I don't I know. I think it did he, actually he, fluctuate a little. He was. Bit he was a. Um, he was a dual threat, high school quarterback, uh, Gainwell. That is. Uh, so he hasn't been actually playing this set position for right for he's very in position. Long. Yeah. Um, hey, and shout out to Memphis because they know what the fuck they're doing. I'm running back. Apparently, there. That, was, that was the next thing I had was you apparently, know that, that Memphis man. pipeline has been insane. You have Darryl Howard Henderson, Henderson Gibson. Yeah, yeah, Daryl Henderson, ton of potential there. Just Jeez. very electric. He had two thousand. He had two. I think he had back to back two thousand yard seasons. Yeah, like, in total yards. That's ridiculous. Pollard like, came in, yeah. who could easily be a very solid player given the opportunity you've seen right. in spot duty. Gibson comes in last season. He just looks like he's bursting at the seam every time he fucking touches the ball. Right. And then you have Gainwell, uh, who. If Mike Norvell is quoted as saying he was the best athlete he's been around at Memphis. Like, yeah. That's ridiculous. Like, and so one thing is like, I see that I feel like there could possibly be from all this Memphis success or, and, and love there may be a possible market, like overcorrection in, in the, the elevated stock price yeah. for Gainwell, just in general. Like, Maybe. I think, I think people are going to be a little bit like, there's just, there's now a stigma attached to what's coming out of Memphis sure. and the success of those bags. Then, yeah. So I think there may it may be a little bit of an elevated price tag on Gainwell where he's not as much like some of those other guys where <laughs> he needs to go to the right system. Right. To, and I, I said with pot, like I was in on Gibson because I was wrong on Pollard because I didn't think that he would be able to, I thought he was like a, a tweener kind of slot guy and he, he went and did his thing and I, I, I was wrong and I was all in on Gibson. Um, but it seems like th- there he's going to game. is going to be very dependent on what, coaching scheme in mind grabs him and how they intend on using him. And, and, and then that coach stays around long enough to implement what his vision was for Gainwell. Um, Cause a lot of right. the times you might see somebody who grabs him, he gets drafted. Then two years later, the coach changes over, right. Which, you know? Um, so th- I think there's a lot of things with Gainwell that are, that are really fun and really great. And he's, he's got a good change of direction. Um, he knows where to be on the field as a receiver, like as far as where to sit down, where to be to get a soft spot. And he knows how to use the field then as a runner. Um, so, and as, he just seems pretty natural at everything that yeah, he does, yeah, like he's, all he's of his movements good, and all of his yeah, everything. Just seems, uh, so I just, I do throw like, I'm not going to draft. I don't think I would draft game well in the first round of a rookie draft. It depends on where he lands. Well, I well, think, there's a couple of places where I could say, sure, I really but trust that guys. mind there, but there's sure. other there's other places where he's going to go, and I'm like, I don't know what to think of that guy and how they're going to use him. Like Lafleur didn't really use Derrick Henry very much when he was in uh, Tennessee. Tennessee, and then he goes over there, and you know he has a great running game and uses the shit out of Aaron Jones last year, a little <laughs> different this year, right? Um, but you know, there's some guys that I absolutely would trust with Gainwell, and and I do think the the big best thing of Gainwell is. He does seem like there's people out there and there's coaches out there who definitely view football moving towards a little bit more position less football. Yes, yeah. And I think he's a perfect kind of guy for that, but he just has to be with the right guy who understands that kind of stuff. Yeah, I th- that's a great I think that's a great point, man. I mean, I think we're we're seeing that in the NFL now with the Debo Samuels of the world and the Visca right. Chenaults of the world, you know, Alvin Kamara was I think the one who kind of sparked it because how good he was as a receiver naturally. Um, but man, I mean, you're right. It's, it's going to be very much, you know, where he goes, the environment he goes into. Um, imagine if he goes, like, like I said, San Francisco's a spot for ETN, man. What if, the, what if it's game? Well, 
Right. I mean, sure. And that'd be one of those situations spot. where I under, like, I, I'm a Niners fan. Like I, I right. like home I have all spot. the Shanahan knows what he's doing. I have full confidence in what he's got going on. Like, I understand how he's going to scheme things like Chenault. I, I like Chenault, but like, I didn't have any confidence that the Jaguars were going to use him no. properly. And, and do I think urban Meyer has a decent handle on using guys like that? He has a history with some guys like that, but he's never coached in the league before. I don't know what the fuck he's going to do. And I, yeah, sure. I would buy, I would still buy, buy Chenault, I, I'm, I'll buy some Chenault. I'm, oh, I like sure. Chenault. Like I really <laughs> yeah. do. I they saw some hey, good things out of LaVisca. Uh, Curtis Samuel, like you saw yeah, finally man. somebody come uh, into that system it, yeah. and, and use him. Well, yeah, urban Meyer tied to that, but Joe Brady yeah. comes in and use uh, all of a sudden Amp- there was points of the season where Curtis Samuel looked like he was fucking unguardable and they were giving him the ball a couple of times, you know, yeah, running the ball. No, he, yeah, so for sure. there are certain minds in certain systems where I, you know, if uh, is Curtis Samuel a free agent this year, like, yes, he is. Yeah. I could see the Carolina Panthers taking Gainwell, and I would be, I would be way more into Gainwell if a guy like rule. And I know Brady seems to be there for another year now. So I'm okay with that. Like, I like yeah. that. I it's going to be like, you're, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's going to be very situation dependent with him. Um, him more so than the other two guys. Yeah, I that we agree. talked about before, um, because those two guys, ETN and Williams, are more pure runners. Yeah, than they are receivers. And Game was the opposite of that. So um, it'll be interesting to see where he goes, um, what his role is in the NFL. Um, but yeah. I think he's a darn good player. And me too. If he, if he lands in a really good spot. And you need a running back. I'm happy with taking him in the back back end of the first round in the rookie draft. I, I could get and by the time I was Antonio Gibson was like the middle of the second to me yep. leading up, and then Geis left, and then all yeah, of a sudden no. I ended up taking Antonio Gibson at one eight, one nine, one ten yeah. area because why not? Uh, because it's running backs and the running back, the reason that you shoot on those you shoot your shots in rookie drafts or running backs is because the value explosion. And the scarcity of the position is so great where I, as I can find a receiver literally growing on the tree in my backyard um, and feel sure. good about putting him in my lineup anyway. All right, let's move on. J-, J Wayne, do you have anything to comment on Gainwell? Sorry. Um, Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't think I could have him this high in this tier. I struggle a little bit with him. I, I you know, I like, I, I obviously agree with the versatility and, and everything that, that you said there. And I think he's a great pass catching uh, back. Um, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. I think he might be one of the more, uh, you know, lo- landing spot dependent players. Um, and we can move along here. I, I say, let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break and maybe even just wrap this uh, first episode up. Um, Cause we've been going here over an hour. Um, Angela, are you cool to stick around a little bit longer? You good? Yeah. I think I have about a half hour. I'm good. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a quick break, um, and we'll maybe put a wrap on this episode, start another one. Um, For those of you guys listening, we got Angelo uh, underscore fantasy uh, joining us, right? Find him on the Twitter. It's a wealth of knowledge. It's not just useless, stupid tweets that people are saying the dumbest shit. That is not what you're going to find on Angelo's feed. You're going to find nothing but information and good shit. And make sure you go over to his website, uh, angeloanalysis.com. Um, subscribe to that thing with your email address and make sure you check out that Who's Next series. And then um, if you're looking for some more detailed analysis, so sign up for that subscription. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick break. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Dynasty. If you're all watching on YouTube, please hit subscribe. Uh, leave us a comment below. And uh, we appreciate you. Um, and we'll be back with more for your pleasure. 